We're moving on with Chapter 7, Nursing Management of Pain During Labor and Delivery. Yes, it can get very painful and a lot of women don't handle it very well and a lot of women handle it extremely well. You just, a lot of women don't know their pain threshold till they get to this stage of the game. So we'll learn all about how to deal naturally and with um, medication. So our objectives are what kind of classes are available to pregnant women, factors that influence a woman's comfort during labor, advantages and limitations of not using medication and using medication, and um, childbirth preparation. Education for childbirth, you know, um, there's all kinds of classes out there, as we've said in past lectures, that we would like preparation to begin be before someone ever conceives, but we all know how realistic that is a lot of the times. So we um, offer child different childbirth classes and we'll review which ones they are. Um, pregnant women are usually interested in how labor will feel and how to manage effectively. Women who are gonna deliver at home, usually they're pretty educated on having the right supplies, what to do, how it's gonna go, they've met with their midwife, things like that. Preparation for childbirth is pretty darn important. The women who come in not prepared are usually more scared and um, don't deal as well with the pain because they just don't know what to expect. So all kinds of classes available, gestational diabetes mellitus. Believe it or not, there's an actual class for that because it's just sadly so prevalent these days that um, people need to know exactly what's happening early pregnancy, exercise for pregnant women, infant care, breastfeeding. You, you'd be surprised how hard breastfeeding can be for some women, um, no matter how hard they try. It's every woman's breasts are different, nipples are different. It's just how much milk they make, things like that. So it's kind of nice to know how to prepare for that. Siblings, sibling preparation can be huge in how you introduce a new baby to the family grandparents, and um, of course, adolescents. That is a whole different ball of wax, and it's good to have classes. We'll talk more about that. Different variations of childbirth classes are refresher courses, which are super nice because it just kind of um, goes over material that they learned before. It's a good review and ways to help the siblings adjust to a new baby because now there's a sibling involved, right? Cesarean birth, the first cesarean usually isn't planned and lots of times it can be a whirlwind, scary because it can be emergent and um, just wasn't something that people had planned on with a C-section. So it's kind of nice to go when you're thinking clearly and um, know what to expect for a re repeat cesarean section. Vaginal birth after a cesarean, you know, we call that TOLAC, trial of labor after a cesarean. I tried that with my second baby. My first baby was 10 pounds, just as an example. So he just didn't fit. Well, we knew my second baby was gonna be smaller. He, you could just tell. And um, I tried labor again, but it, you have to be super careful. Nowadays, you have to, it has to be in a hospital that can do crash C-sections. If I knew then what I knew now, I never would have done it. Um, I just don't feel it's worth the risk, but a lot of people do, and a lot of people have success. But one of the bad outcomes that happened, one of our patients decided she wanted to be, try to be back TOLAC and um, went to another hospital and she ruptured her uterus and lost her baby. So she made these um, Build-A-Bear with all her friends and put them in boxes with a little remembrance card of her little boy and said, um, her statement was, which I, I'm, I'm for people trying it in a safe place. I'm not trying to discourage people from doing it. I just, my point is make sure you're in a place that can do crash cesarean sections, crash. Like I told you that one that ruptured in when I worked at Kaiser and we got the baby out in seven minutes, that's a crash that saves babies' brains. And I think the hospital she went to, there were delays. 
So um, my point is do your homework on that if you want to encourage people or, to, you know, be knowledgeable about that. But anyways, she just said, you know, they give you these statistics about um, how safe they are and the risk factor is point, point 0.1, something like that of a ruptured uterus. She said, but what if you're the point 0.1 like I was? And it's true. So you have to decide for yourself whether you're willing to risk that or not. And the other thing I have to say about that is we have repeat cesarean sections come in and they go to um, the C-section room and they open them up and they have what's called a window where they it looks like it was opening up inside there. So it's kind of scary. Uh, so you just you got to be careful about that. And then again, adolescent childbirth preparation classes. So um, with the VBAC, the TOLAC, we may need to, um, they may want the classes to be able to express their feelings because um, it may have been really scary. People have post-traumatic stress from birth when it's really traumatic. Or if we had to run back, all of a sudden a cord prolapse, something like that, and they are terrified that they may not live or the baby or both. And then adolescents, you know, their needs are so different that, from those of an adult. And imagine an adolescent, a little 13 year old in the same class as adults going to Lamaze. Most of them wouldn't do as well than being with their own peers, their own age group, where they feel comfortable and um, the girls can be in a significant source of support for each other. So I, you know, I'm not positive where all, what counties have adolescent classes, but it's certainly something to look into to see if those are available or even online. Okay, the content of childbirth preparation classes. Changes produced by pregnancy and childbirth. They go through all the physiology and what um, changes are produced by the pregnancy so that they don't respond with such fear and tension. They know what to expect for the most part. And cesarean birth, of course. What is a cesarean birth? And um, why is it needed? And how is it done? And how long does it last? Things like that. Benefits of exercise during pregnancy. They have found that it lowers the rate of preterm birth and complications if women um, exercise during pregnancy. And it also helps those muscles. Think about using those muscles. Your uterus is a muscle. There are so many muscles used and for pushing, things like that, that think about strengthening those muscles in order to, that they don't tire out as quickly as they would if you didn't strengthen them, things like that, okay? So they also, the classes also teach you about pain control methods for labor, skin stimulation. If I were you guys, I'd know about effleurage. I put a little thing over here for that. It's a technique in massage in which long, light, or firm strokes are used, usually over the spine and back, a lot of women do it over their belly, though. It's a light technique performed with the tips of the fingers in a circular pattern over one part of the body or in long strokes. So um, right here, fingertip effleurage in, of the abdomen is a technique commonly used in the Lamaze class. So you need to know the different kinds of techniques. Diversion and distraction, we'll get into that. Breathing techniques. Um, let's see. Okay. Childbirth and pain. It's just very different kind of pain. You know, when you're a nurse in a hospital, think about it. We're usually saying pain isn't good. Let's get rid of that pain. We got to fix the problem of that pain. In OB, people, I even had a dad go, oh my God, you're brutal because she started getting in more pain. I'm like, yay, good. You're getting into labor. Pain is good in our world. We try to help them through that pain and decrease that pain, of course. But the point is, is contractions hurt. And if contractions are doing their job to get the baby out, we need pain. That's, that's the way of it. So pain in childbirth is very different. It's personal and subjective, but it is part of the normal birth process. Women have several months to prepare for pain management, 
it's self-limiting and rapidly declines after birth so it goes away right away but we need as nurses to be empathetic and try to help them cope with it and um, alleviate that pain and if that means effleurage if that means a bathtub if that means walking uh, massage if that means pain medicine whatever you know the patient we need to do they need to be informed and make informed choices a lot of women like me go in saying oh my goodness i can do this no pain medicine is going to touch my body i am strong i am so strong i will never take pain medicine and after 10 hours of hard labor i'm like can i have another shot yet it people don't know how bad it hurts and after several hours of it um you get tired so sometimes you cave i caved and most women do and really we shouldn't call it caving we should say just do what you need to do but our responsibility as a ob nurse is to help modify as many factors as possible so the woman can safely tolerate pain of labor and delivery if laying in bed hurts let's get them in a rocking chair let's get them in the bathtub let's get them in the shower let's get them on their hands and knees and have the dad or significant other press on their lower back things like that let's let's help them okay okay so there's a lot of factors that influence labor pain a patient's culture again previous experience with pain if their first experience was horrific they're in there anticipating that and again your uterus is a muscle they tighten up it can cause a lot of issues with your psyche you guys need to know the difference between pain threshold and pain tolerance threshold perception the least amount of sensation that a person perceives is painful pain tolerance the greatest amount of pain one is willing to endure so if so a lot of times you, when you admit a patient you say so what is the maximum pain level that you usually in life endure without pain medicine some people say seven some people say two depends on how good they are dealing with pain okay so the sources of pain during labor dilatation and stretching of the cervix reduced uterine blood flow so contractions remember it's cutting off blood supply during a contraction that tightening it's like when you um do weight training you know you get that burn lots of times that's what a contraction is that ischemia pressure of the fetus on the pelvic structures structures lots of times that head's pushing down on the bones and it just hurts stretching of the vagina and perineum when they get when they're pushing the ring of fire on those muscles and um, tissues that are stretching so the physical factors to modify the pain um, central nervous system factors there's this gate control theory which we'll talk about it's how this didn't get set up right on this slide i'm noticing but anyways it's how pain impulses reach the brain for interpretation and we're going to go through that later i have a slide that shows it um, but massage are ways to close the gate to the painful impulses endorphins we're going to talk a lot more about that in a minute body zone morphine you need to know that it's compared to morphine maternal conditions how ready is that patient for this cervical readiness are they coming in thick closed and high or are they coming in dilated to five completely thinned out and the head well applied how big is their pelvis how strong are their contractions right now how tired are they already have they been in padromal labor for two weeks already and they're exhausted they haven't slept they're uncomfortable they've gotten up to pee five times a night how ready are they how tired already are they endorphins i just thought this was funny i hope no one takes offense exercise gives you endorphins endorphins make you happy happy people don't shoot their husbands they just don't i love that because in labor a lot of women are not liking their husbands too much right then even though they were definitely participants in the whole thing but endorphins they're also they're neuromodulators also known as endogenous opiates that's why it's compared to morphine protein chemicals found in the brain 
It's known to relieve pain. Endorphins are similar to morphine-like substances believed to play a role in biologic response to pain. That's why when people exercise, things like that, a lot of people get happier. They release endorphins in their body. They may be produced by stress and increase the pain threshold, may make the woman drowsy and sleepy. Positive pregnant experience releases an increase of maternal natural endorphins. You often hear women say if they were induced with Pitocin, their labor was a lot worse, more painful than if they'd had a natural labor. Well, that's because the body responds differently with the release of endorphins when you are induced. Your contractions with Pitocin come on faster and harder. You don't get the gradual increase that you do with um, natural labor. So it doesn't stimulate the brain to release the natural endorphins. So that's the difference that people don't realize. Okay, so this gate control theory is a very interesting theory and it can work. It's just, um, it's a theory. And again, it just, there's a lot of factors, but here's the theory. The, there's a gate a mechanism that occurs in the spinal cord. Pain sensations are transmitted from the periphery of the body along nerve pathways to the brain. Only a limited number of sensations can travel at a time. So that's where distraction or focus, focused activity can replace travel of that pain sensation. Gate closes and impulses are less likely to be transmitted to the brain when activity fills the path. When gate opens, pain impulses ascend to the brain. So I found this picture of the gate control theory. And you can see down at the bottom, the small diameter fibers. And see the gate. The gate is open on the left, closed on the right. So those impulses, only some get through on the left to the open gate. So what they're trying to say is there's going to be some pain but you can reduce it by occupying them with natural things which we'll talk more about okay yeah so it's um the closed gate also is from like palm and fingertip pressure heat and cold applications massage it helps re close that gate and reduce those impulses to go through to the brain. Okay, there's also a lot of factors that influence pain during labor. So where, how is that fetus presented? Remember we talked about OP position, sunny side up, face up? Well, remember we talked about the back of that baby's head now, the occiput, is in that mother's spine. So it causes a tremendous amount more pain. You hear people, my 10 pounder was direct OP, straight up and down. My back labor, I kept saying to the nurses and my husband, if you could take away my back pain, I could handle the labor pain. I felt like my back was gonna snap in two with every contraction. Well, it's because his big head, 20, it was 22 inches long, 10 pounds, huge. He was pressing on my spine with every contraction. Also, think of those heads pressing on the cervix, which it's supposed to do, but it's causing dilatation and effacement, which causes pain. Abnormal presentation applies an uneven pressure. So if the baby's come down, coming down in an abnormal way, that uneven pressure results in less effective effacement and can prolong things. So what we can do as caregivers, we put in an ID, we, list, we watch the baby closely, so continuous fetal monitoring. Amniotomy is what the doctor does that breaks the water when the head is low enough, well applied to the cervix so that we don't worry about the cord coming down. Um, vag exam or other interruptions, we need to um, be careful and do them only as needed. And again, we things that can modify pain is culture. Some do really well with it and some don't do well with it. So we need to keep that in mind. So I also wanna to add to that, um, women who come in and have really quick labors 
oh my goodness, they're in a lot more pain. And there's a reason for that. The ones who have short in, short labors, are it's usually more intense. So they experience more pain. It's not as gradual as a, a regular everyday labor patient. The cervix, vagina, and perineum stretch more abruptly for these people. And contractions come so fast that the woman can't recover from one before the next begins. So it can be super intense for these people. That's usually a precipitous labor, which means less than two hours from start to finish. And precipitous labor and delivery. And um, those women usually say, oh my God, I would have preferred a 10 hour labor any day to that. Two hours of um, intense pain is can be super hard for people. Plus, let's talk about fatigue. Think about when you guys get fatigued, and I'm sure that's been a lot since you've been in school and working and families and things like that. Our pain tolerance usually doesn't do as well, and our coping skills. Just when I get tired after a 12-hour shift, my coping skills aren't as good as when I first got to work, right? Many women are tired when labor begins and sleep um, because they've been sleep deprived throughout the pregnancy. The fetus is active at night. They have to get up and pee. They could have shortness of breath while they're laying down because the pressure of the baby on their lungs. So there's all kinds of factors with that. Okay, so also um, the fetal presentation and position, let's get back to that for a second. Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself on the slides. So the presenting part, usually the fetal head, acts as a wedge to efface, so thin out and dilate the cervix when each contraction pushes the fetal head downwards, okay? Fetal has the smooth, head is smooth and round, and that's what helps. Again, when it's not smooth and round, that's when you can have more problems and longer labors. The fetus usually turns during early labor so that the occiput is in the front left or right quadrant of the mother's pelvis. So remember we talked about OA, OP, things like that. So we want OA. Each contraction pushes, pushes it against the mother's sacrum, resulting in persistent and poorly relieved back pain when the baby is face up, right? Sunny side up. And lots of times the labor's longer because we're trying to get the baby to turn at the same time we're trying to get the baby to come down. So that can just be a lot more work. Okay, so let's talk now about non-pharmacological pain management. Advantages, it does no harm to the mother or the fetus. They don't slow down labor like some medications can, and sometimes they provide adequate pain control. Adequate, I'm not saying takes pain away, I'm saying adequate for that patient to get through it just can help her cope with labor before it's advanced enough to be given medication. If she's two and in, um, in labor, dilated to two, we need to try to help her so we don't give pain medicine too early. No risk for allergies or adverse drug effects. Poorly relieved pain increases fear and anxiety. And we've already talked again about the psyche but this can divert blood flow from the uterus, which can cause issues for the fetus. So you can see how it all factors in and we need to look at all those P's of labor, right? Remember, pelvis, passenger, psyche, and um, passageway. Limitations. So we um, couples should rehearse these techniques before labor begins so they it's familiar and not uncomfortable when they're doing it. But again, it doesn't work for everyone. So we need to always be aware of that. So this is a slide that's not in your book, but I added it. It's um, pain control strategies without medicine. So of course, general support. Most women need someone with them, whether it's a doula, whether it's a husband, significant other, best friend, mother, aunt. Usually it's somebody that is in there to be their support person. Imagery or visualization. Um, I think we talk about that later, yes. Okay, and then changes in temperature. 
and you see this woman in the picture laying in the bathtub that's awesome that it, and I put pillows in there I put bath blankets I just put them in the laundry afterwards sop and wet but it really helps them distraction is such a good one play cards play a game watch a movie a lot of people come in and just lay there waiting for the next contraction I love it when you have um, patients that bring in all kinds of stuff and the patient may have to stop during a contraction to breathe and then continue on with the game I had a patient one time it was so awesome she was in active labor and the whole family was playing Scrabble it was so fun and um, it was time at our old birth center you had to take them down the hall to this really big nice bathtub so I said so the husband was playing Scrabble and the patient was ready to go down the hall and I said okay I'll take her to the bathtub he goes no I'll take her and I go no no that's my job I'll take her and he goes no you know and he pulls me aside he goes you know what will help me the most is if you play Scrabble with the family so I can have some time with her down at the bathtub it was awesome and she was my only patient so I sat and played Scrabble while they were in the bathtub and had a blast so sometimes it can be fun too anyway um, touch some women want to be touched and rubbed and things other ones are like don't touch me don't touch me you just got to find what works for each patient okay comfort measures again birth ball bathtubs showers whirlpool is wonderful if it's available some hospitals have them some don't we did but all ours are broken now and you can't get parts so we're trying to figure out what we're going to do at our hospital okay moving on there's different methods of childbirth preparation the dick reed method he was an english physician and he's the one who introduced the concept of fear tension pain cycle during labor he felt like if we can get these women relaxed and educate them in relaxation techniques that'll interrupt that pain cycle Bradley method is um, husband coach childbirth it was the first one system to include the father as the integral part of labor and it emphasized slow abdominal breathing and relaxation techniques Lamaze is probably the one people hear about the most and that is used the most it's psychoprophylactic so they want you to use you know brain and body mental techniques that condition the woman to respond to contractions with relaxation rather than tension that's where you always hear the he he who's come in you know you focus on your breathing rather than the pain and um other mental techniques to limit the brain's ability to interpret labor sensations as painful so it really does help people if they can get into that space or use a focal point and um, focal point like some people bring in a picture some people just find a little spot on the wall one person put a smiley face sticker on the ceiling that the patient could look at during every contraction and just focus on that so that they can stare at that and focus on their breathing rather than the pain okay more objectives we're going to just talk more about non-pharmacological methods and pharmacological methods and the nurse role in that okay so again non-pharmacological pain relief measures relaxation techniques um, so things to have in a mom's toolkit ability to release tension techniques require concentration thus again occupying the mind while reducing the muscle tension validating the woman's discomfort and providing support is essential for us as nurses during the whole all stages of labor you know some women want you in there the whole time and sometimes you can do that depending on how busy you are other women it's like come when I need you you just you kind of have to play it by ear and see how they are some women get very rude about it and some women are very sweet about it you just don't know how they're going to handle it and they don't either until they're in that pain okay so things that the significant others can do us as nurses can do to help coach them through this and relax is we can see where they're tensing up say okay relax your left arm I see that you're tensing up relax your left arm 
and you see them start to relax it. Relax your facial muscles and they'll start to relax. Most of the time, we don't even realize in life how tense we're being until someone points it out. So that's what we're doing in labor is just saying, okay, now relax your legs, things like that. Again, muscles, we're using so many of the muscles in our body. So the skin stimulation, um, there's just different, you know, massages and things that you can do and oils that can be used to rub, depending on what your preferences are. Again, here's this effleurage. It stimulates the large diameter nerve fibers that inhibit painful stimuli that travel through the small diameter fibers. So again, strokes her abdomen in a circular movement during contractions. That's the effleurage you need to know. Sacral pressure. So pressing on the lower back when a baby is OP. I remember my husband's hands were numb from pressing on my lower back during a contraction. It's that spot. If the if someone presses on it during a contraction, it takes a lot of the pressure off and um, really helps. So thermal stimulation. It's just, you know, warmth in a warm water in a glove. Again, <laughs> there's you've got to be smart about providing warmth because too many people have gotten burned from nurses doing stupid things. Heating up bottles in a microwave and it's uneven, you press it on the patient and they get third degree burns, things like that. Babies have gotten burns from nurses doing things like that. So you've got to be super careful how you heat things up and what you use, okay? Positioning is huge in labor. Again, you don't, the worst thing a patient can do is lay in bed. You want them up in hands and knees, in a rocking chair. Um, we showed you with the birth ball, with the peanut balls, things like that. There's just, think about if a baby's head is coming down in a wrong way. It's called asynclitic, like their ear is on their shoulder instead of coming out straight, you know, in that flexed position. So if you reposition a lot, it lets that fetus reposition also and get lined up better a lot of times. If you do hands and knees when the baby is OP positioned, you know, face up, put the mom on their hands and knees and have them rock. Think about that belly hanging down. That allows the baby way more room to move. So think about all the ways and why we would use those positions for certain things that we suspect as labor nurses. So diversion and distraction, again, the focal point or imagery. I use that a lot when a patient's really freaking out. I know I talked about this before, but I'll say, I want you to picture yourself right now. You're on this beautiful beach and you're holding your little baby in your arms Think about what color does your hair does your baby have? The waves are coming in and it's so peaceful and beautiful and your baby's in your arms, things like that. You can't believe how it can calm down a patient and get them refocused again. So try hard to do that. Music, what does music do for you, you guys, when you go out dancing or you're around the house? When I turn, my husband and I flip houses, when I turn on my music, I get so much more energetic when my favorite songs come on and I, it gets me going. So think about that in labor. Some people like great music. Some people like calm music just to soothe the soul, right? Depends on what works for you, that patient. TV? TV shows, anything that is a distraction. Again, breathing can help release endorphins. I use this a lot also. I'll say, okay, take a deep breath through your nose. Hold it. That's re those endorphins, now you let it out and it's releasing endorphins. Think about when you do that yourself. When I get anxiety, I do that myself. I have. I take those deep breaths and hold it. It releases endorphins so that you can calm down. So again, with relaxation, most effective teaching time once labor has become begun is in between contractions during the first stage of labor. So what this slide is trying to say to you is don't wait till they're eight 
getting in transition and don't want to listen to a word you say. Do it early on when they're still smiling between contractions, when they can hear you, when they can ask questions, if you have that time. If they come in dilated to eight, there's not a whole lot you can do. You just do the best you can. But if you have the luxury of um, early on, that's the most effective teaching time. Again, thermal stimulation is awesome. Warm bath or shower during the early phase. I put them in the shower when they're completely dilated if they're a primate because they still have pushing to do. Cool damp cloth to the forehead later in labor. Usually that's during pushing because they're working hard and they're getting hot and sweaty. Hot or cold towels applied to the back or the back of the neck. Anything that feels good, I offer it up. And sometimes they take me up on it and sometimes they don't. Again, some examples of distraction. Breathing, listening to music, verbal coaching. Some people do super well with verbal coaching. I'll have a patient just look at me frantically and wait for what I have to say and do it. And they just are like grasping anything you say. And other people are like, I'm not listening to you. Could you please stop talking? Again, effleurage, acupuncture, if you have the luxury of acupuncture, awesome. But acupuncture is expensive. To have someone come into an acupuncture, that's not always what people can do. External analgesics. So, you know, of course, like rubs, things like that. Back massage. Hypnosis, I put this in here. It's not in your book, just because in the old book it had it. And some people do use this. Some people go get tapes made. Seems to be safe without known side effects. It's a positive physical and psychological outcome. Women in labor is usually trained in self-hypnosis. So we may trigger it, or they usually, I, I don't know how to trigger it unless they tell me. Usually, like I said, they bring in their own tapes or they have their person that does hypnosis come in. But we do want to do careful observation and document anything concerning, of course. So, question number one. A woman is in the first stage of labor. She reports that she's experiencing moderate back discomfort with every contraction. The best non-pharmacological intervention you can encourage is, would it be diversion, sacral pressure, effleurage, thermal stimulation? So remember, we're picking the best one. And what would be our clue in this question? The clue would be back discomfort, okay? So we want sacral pressure. That would make the most sense. The other three are good things to do, but the one we think would help the most for this patient would be sacral pressure. So again, think it through. When you take the quizzes, you wanna look at keywords. What I always recommend you guys is highlight on your test of course, Oh, you can't, you're not taking the paper ones. Jeez, everything's changed. But even if you have to write down as you're taking the quiz, the highlighted words that you would have highlighted, I mean, um, or just make sure you go back and read the questions so you remember what they're trying to give you hints about for the right answer, okay? So breathing, there's all different kinds of breathing techniques out there. And most patients come in, I took Lamaze and I was gonna go do my hee hee hoos. And I, when my husband got in my face and said, he who, I'm like, I'm not doing that. But I ended up doing it because I found that it helped. Again, it was the focusing. And it is changing the focus during the contraction. It can be taught to the unprepared woman. I do all the time. Even if they are prepared, they are in pain and they forget oh, this is how I'm supposed to be breathing. So you just help them breathe. Lots of times it's because they start hyperventilating and we're gonna talk about that too. So I say, slow it down, take your deep breaths. And um, so that's a lot of what a labor nurse does. So in the first stage, we're gonna do the slow paced breathing. And also, by the way, we need to remind the patients, don't start all this until they really need it. Don't waste their energy in the early phases of labor. 
So breathing techniques, it says down at the bottom of the slide here, should be started when they can no longer talk, walk, or ignore the pain of contractions. You start it too early, then anything that you start too early is usually less effective when you really need it. So um, the first stage, we should just do some slow paced breathing, you know, just breathe in and out. Then modified pace. During the contraction, the woman breathes more rapidly and shallowly, but the rate should be no more than twice her usual rate. In this variation, she begins with a cleansing breath. All breathing should begin with a cleansing breath. And I always say, do it through your nose to release those endorphins, that cleansing breath. So in and out, just in, cleansing, out. And now start your or whatever breathing you're encouraging them to do. So in the uh, modified, you're saying, um, begins with cleansing breath, breathe slowly until the peak of the contraction when she begins rapid shallow breathing. As the contraction abates, she resumes the slow deep breathing and ends with a cleansing breath. And we'll talk about um, hyperventilation and we'll t is sometimes a problem with that. Like if you right now, if you do that too fast, you can feel a little lightheaded, tingly fingers. That's when we need to say, um, slow it down or make it more shallow, okay? So pattern paced breathing, you can read this in your book on page 170, requires her to focus on the pattern of her breathing. So again, trying to take your mind off that pain. So the constant pattern is pant, 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 blow, pant, 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 blow, and so on. Stair step, pant, blow, pant, blow. It just depends on what works seriously for that patient. They find their own rhythm when they do start to try to do the any kind of those breathing techniques. Um, another variation is the woman's partner calls out random numbers to indicate the number of pants to take before a blow. If she feels an urge to push before her cervix is fully dilated, we tell them to blow. We'll go, okay, instead of, because a lot of people will start to bear down and we don't want to tear their cervix, right? That's, that's an, can bleed and cause all kinds of problems. So I always say, just blow through it, <laughs> blow it out so that they don't push. Okay. Second stage pushing is a whole different one. It's where you hold your breath and do the Valsapa, we talked about that, or open glottis pushing, where you don't hold your breath, you bear down with your mouth open. So here's the different breathing patterns, and that's also on page 170 in your book of what people do. And again, most people modify it to do whatever works for them. We just give them the ideas or what they learned in classes. How to recognize and correct hyperventilation. I'll, so much of the time, I'll have a patient go, my, my fingers are tingling. Well, that's one of the signs of um, hyperventilating. Dizziness, cramps and muscle spasms of the hands, numbness around the nose and mouth, blurring of the vision. So we're either going to, some people bring in their own paper bag. Some people, we don't have them. So we tell them to breathe into their cupped hands start to breathe a little slower, a little more shallow. Place a moist washcloth over the mouth and nose while breathing. A lot of patients do that. Hold breath for a few seconds before exhaling. Whatever works to treat that um, hyperventilation. Okay, here we go again. I think this is pretty easy after that, but a laboring woman reports that she is dizzy and experiencing tingling in her hands and around her mouth and nose. You recognize that these symptoms are most likely related to, which do you think it is? Is it stroke, anxiety, medication side effects? Yes, it could be any of those, but 99.9% .9 of the time it's hyperventilation. Okay, so that's the best answer to pick. So one of the biggest tips you can do is don't fix what isn't broken. If they're six, the patient is successfully using a safe, non-pharmacological non pain control technique, don't interfere. Don't offer up pain medicine at that moment. Don't, you can say, is there anything you need? Things like that, make it very open-ended. But um, if they're doing it well on their own, let's leave it be until they 
appear to need more. Okay, so what's our role as the nurse with non-pharmacological techniques? First of all, let's get information. Did they take any classes? Did they take refreshers? Did they go online? Anything. It just aids you guys in helping to know how much education they might need or just need reinforcement. And again, education should be attempted between contractions. Help identify what signs of tension and help with relax and relaxation techniques with that. Minimize environmental irritants. I can't stress this enough. Keep her clean and dry. Can you, well, you know how you feel when you get all sweaty and stinky and gross and you lay in that bed and you feel like you're laying in it? Clean them up. Get them in the bathtub. Do a little bed bath if you need to. Um, don't have noxious smells. A lot of times when they're in active labor, I say, do you want me to bring the tray in? If they don't want it, sometimes the husband or significant other does. But I'll say, do you want them to eat it in here? I know when I was in labor, my husband tried to eat a hamburger while I was in labor and I couldn't take it. Every time I smelled it, it made me want to throw up. So, you know, it's the patient that we need to be concerned with at this stage of the game. So if the dad needs to eat or significant other, then he, maybe he can go to the waiting room real quick or something like that. Or maybe he can wait, things like that. Or eat something that doesn't smell. <laughs> Okay, so we want to relieve thirst. We always keep, most people at our birth center love our ice chips. They're crunchy. So get them ice, relieve their thirst, keep them clear of sweat and heat. Reposition them, adjust those monitor belts. Take them off if you can for a while. Make them more comfortable. So now we get into pharmacological pain management and this is where it gets a little more complicated. So there's all different kind of pharmacological pain management methods that we use in labor and delivery. Analgesics are systemic. Then there's adjunctive drugs that we'll talk about. Anesthetics, regional, loss of sensation. General is loss of consciousness and sensation. So physiology of pregnancy and its relationship to analgesia and anesthesia. There's a higher risk for hypoxia caused by pressure of that uterus pressing up on the diaphragm. So it can affect how they breathe, of course. Sluggish GI tract in pregnant women. So puts them at increased risk for vomiting and aspiration. So very, very, very important for a doctor coming in and giving um, anesthesia for a C-section or something to know when the patient's last food intake was. Whether they ask or not, it's important for you to say, Dr. So-and-so, her last solid food intake was this, her last fluid intake was this. Of course, if you think she's going for a C-section anytime during the labor, I stop the food. I say, you know what, it's 50-50 right now. I just feel like we're better off if we don't. I still let them usually um, sip on some water, try to keep it to a minimum for their sake. You don't want aspiration pneumonia, right? So um, that's just kind of an important factor. Some anesthesiologists, unless the baby's in distress, they won't do the C-section until they've been NPO for several hours. So also ato, um, aortocaval compression increases risk of hypotension and development of shock. Are they laying on their back? Effect on fetus must also be considered with all these um, things. If your baby's already having a rough time, we don't give narcotics because what does that do to a fetus? That can also depress them more. So you have to be very careful what you offer up and of course discuss with your doctor if there's an issue, but when you've been doing it as long as I have, you pretty much know what you're gonna pick for that patient, whether it be a intraspinal narcotic, whether it be a epidural, whether it be a um, IV medication, things like that. We always, always have to think about the effect on the fetus. And remember, two patients. We have two patients that we are having to worry about. The goal of pain relief is to provide maximum comfort with minimum effect on the fetus. You have to critical think it. You have to critical think how that, what stage of labor we're at when we're giving it, how the fetus is doing it, 
doing so far? How close to delivery are we? We don't, some of these medications we don't want to give, and we'll discuss more about that, like Demerol. Too close to delivery. Advantages. It helps a woman relax and work with their contractions. Otherwise, labor can cause that stress response that we don't want, that release of catecholamines, which could lead to fetal acidosis. Results in increased autonomic activity, so that, again, release of catecholamines, decrease in platelet formation. Do you see how labor and delivery isn't just something as simple as come in, help them breathe, tell them to push, and have a baby? There's so much to it can cause maternal hyperventilation, again, respiratory alkalosis, then compensating metabolic acidosis. If a mom gets acidotic, what do you think is going to happen to that fetus? Yes, fetal acidosis. So let's talk about the limitations. Two people, mother and fetus, again, right there, always, always a factor when you're in labor and delivery. Drug effects can be prolonged in the newborn long after delivery. There's some medications, I think it's um, Valium, that if you give to mom, it literally stays in the baby for 30 days after birth. It can cause depression. So um, in their respirations, things like that. May slow labor's progress if used early in labor, and then it's not as effective when they really need it. So decision to prescribe and administer drugs must be carefully weighed due to the effects on the fetus. The fetus can't metabolize drugs quick, as quickly as mother. So that's got to keep that in mind. Drugs do not usually relieve all pain and pressure sensations. And I warn my patients of that. It, a lot of them can take the edge off and make them be able to tolerate the contractions, but it doesn't always take it away. Now, epidurals usually do. Intraspinals usually do. IV pain medicines are the ones that mostly it takes the edge off and helps them deal better. Okay, so before administering these drugs, this is an extra slide, you want a baseline assessment of the status of the woman and the fetus. Labor should be well established, so they should be dilated to at least four. Primip, we like them to be at least six, but sometimes you can't quite get it that far with a Primip. Um, before we give her pain medicine, we try. So here's the analgesics and adjunctive drugs. So narcotics are usually what are given in their IV. Fentanyl is my favorite. It Remember that it cannot be given orally and it has a rapid onset. Patients, it doesn't seem to make them nauseated or feel funny in the head but it takes the, the edge off their pain. Stadol, we've used that for years and years and years, Butorphanol and Nubane. They um, work very well, but Stadol can really make um, women feel funny in the head and a little bit more depressed as far as, um, you know, a little more sleepy, groggy feeling. And it has more of an effect on the fetus than fentanyl does. Demerol, it says in your book, it's one of the most commonly used, not anymore. I don't know of any labor unit that uses Demerol. When I first started labor and delivery, we used Demerol a lot, but I didn't, I didn't see it help with labor pain. It just kind of made women feel so foggy. I, I hated it. But you, one thing you've got to remember for testing purposes and in life, it has a longer half-life. So most medications like fentanyl and Stadol, we say don't give, if you can, of course, time it right, within an hour of birth. Demerol is two hours. So avoid, if anticipated, within an hour or two of birth. And it does not um, provide complete pain relief. Remember, narcotic antagonist, mostly Narcan is what we use and that you've heard of. It reverses the respiratory depression. Other adjunctive drugs are um, Phenergan, Vistril. Phenergan's for nausea, of course. Vistril, we use that um, more for helping them relax and calm down. And sometimes we'll give Vistril and morphine and send them home. If they've been in prodromal labor, we'll give a shot. Um, Vistril, you don't give IV. Can control nausea and anxiety. 
reduce narcotic requirements during labor. It doesn't relieve the pain though. Just remember, it just helps. And of course, Venergan doesn't relieve pain. It helps the nausea. But lots of times we use it in conjunction with the opioids and that's what helps with everything. Also remember when we give a narcotic, there are many people in this world who don't take very many medications in their lifetime. And so they, it may really affect them. So just be careful having their side rails up. And I like to have someone in there with them if I've given a narcotic and have some Narcan um, on hand if, just in case there's any adverse reactions. Analgesics during labor may reduce hormonal and stress response to the pain of labor and might be especially advantageous to obese. And why they're seeing obese, I think, is because obese women, truly obese, have a longer labor. Usually their labor curve is very different than um, a normal BMI patient. And hypertensive women, it can just help them relax enough to bring their blood pressure down a little bit. Analgesia can reduce gastric emptying. We already said their GI is sluggish. Increasing risk of aspiration if food or fluids are in the stomach. So we need to have careful monitoring of their vital signs and of course the fetal heart rate. Regional analgesics and anesthetics. This is what you hear used a lot these days in labor and delivery. It usually involves placement of an anesthetic in the epidural or subarachnoid space. So there's um, doctors that do that. There's anesthesiologists and CRNA certified um, nurse anesthetists. And um, they come in and do this. The women, the woman, it doesn't affect their brain, just their pain and movement, but they can participate in the birth, retains her protective airway reflexes. What it is, is the membranes around the spinal cord that are the meninges, you know, they have these three layers, the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. So some people say mater, whatever you want to call it. It affects those. It, um, the epi epidural and subarachnoid blocks and intrathecal narcotics are given by injecting those anesthetic drugs so that they bathe the nerves as they emerge from the spinal cord. The spinal cord and nerves are not directly injected. I thought that was very important for you guys to know. They are bathed in this narcotic, okay? So regional anesthesia in obstetrics usually involves the placement of an anesthetic in the epidural or subarachnoid space. Difference between this, again, is analgesic blocks pain, anesthetic blocks pain, and motor responses. So to give you an example, a woman comes in in labor, we've given them IV pain medication, now they're seven, and they're like, I can't take this anymore. So you get them an intraspinal narcotic, okay? So the anesthesiologist comes in and puts fentanyl or whatever med they want to put in. It's a narcotic. Now, two hours later, and they can move, they can talk, they can walk, but their pain is gone. Two hours later, they we need to do a C-section on this patient. We take them back to the OR and they do an intraspinal narcotic. Well, what's the difference? Why now can they not move? Well, they do the anesthet they do the narcotic, like fentanyl, like I said, but they add an anesthetic in there that makes them not feel or move. So that's the difference between a labor intraspinal narcotic and a uh, surgical intraspinal narcotic is the addition of that anesthetic in that shot. People always wonder that and that's the difference, okay? Okay, we'll talk about regional analgesics and anesthetics. If I can get my cursor in the right spot. Okay, again, review. Analgesic blocks pain. Anesthetic blocks pain and motor responses. 
regional anesthetics block the sensation in varying degrees, so that would be your intraspinal narcotic. Epidural block, local anesthetic drugs are combined with an opioid analgesic, constantly infused. That's the difference between an intraspinal narcotic and an epidural, which we'll talk more about. Epidural is a continuous infusion. Subarachnoid spinal block is a regional anesthetic. It's a one shot block. So the doctor comes in, gives the shot in the back and it lasts for a few hours. They may have, it's one shot block at the time, but they can get it repeated up to, I've seen four times. I don't like four times messing with someone's spine, but some people need it if you don't have epidurals. Local and pudendal blocks. The problems with that are vaginal hematoma, and I'm going to go into what those are better in a second. Numbs the perineum just prior to delivery doesn't take away the pain of the contractions, but it numbs the perineum. But pudendal blocks have really, um, they're hardly ever used. They're kind of old school these days, but we still need to talk about them because some doctors still do that. So here's your epidural. I think that's what most people associate with pain relief and labor at hospitals. We just started doing them at our hospital. We did intraspinal narcotics for years and years and years, and we just added epidurals. So the epidural space is a small space just outside the dura, okay? A fine catheter is threaded into the epidural space through the bore of the needle. So the, they numb it up with lidocaine, this area. Then they put this introducer in then they thread that um, catheter through it. So again, local anesthetic drugs are usually combined with a small dose of an opioid analgesic, constant infusion via a special pump. So epidural and epi intrathecal opioids. These are without an anesthetic agent, allows women to sense the contractions without feeling pain. That's what I like. Some epidurals, they don't. Intrathecal, they do more. It's just in a different space. And the videos you guys are gonna watch, I think it'll help you guys understand better what we're talking about and really read it in your book because it, I know this can be a little confusing. But what's nice about these two is it retains the ability ability to voluntarily bear down during the second stage, not always with an epidural, but an intraspinal, it um, wears off and they can feel to push down. Sometimes you have to turn the epidural pump off to get them pushing. So I just wanted to show this. Okay, so it shows your PM matter, mater, and um, the subarachnoid block, where what space it goes in, you can see that on the right. Then on the left, the subarachnoid space, same thing. Epidural block, you can see it goes not as far in as the spinal block, okay? You can see the epidural space. Caudal blocks, you don't hear that anymore That I, in my world. And then just on the bottom, it's showing level of anesthesia for cesarean or vaginal birth, okay? So I found these pictures that I also wanted to show you. Um, on the left side, it's showing you the left and the right, the paracervical block or the pudendal. So paracervical means you have some cervix left, okay? Pudendal is still the pudendal nerve that they're trying to get to. It's, um, and then on the left-hand side, they're showing you the site for lumbar, epidural, and spinal blocks, and the nerves that are getting bathed by that anesthesia or that um, opioid. On the right, and I'm gonna show you a picture in a second, but see the type of needle they're holding? That's a trumpet. It's a needle guide. The needle goes inside that, and the doctor is literally putting their fingers in, finding the ischial spines, because the pudendal nerve, as you can see, is right next to that ischial spine. And that's what they're trying to do, a nerve block, okay? 
again, hardly any doctors do this anymore, but it provides local anesthesia. It's, it was more meant for when we used to do way more episiotomies. It's so that the doctor didn't have to shoot lidocaine in their perineum. And it helped with that ring of fire for patients when they were pushing. So that's why a lot of doctors liked it. It helped give them some pain relief down there, but not the contractions. The bottom left picture, I just wanted to show you how important it is positioning, putting these in. If a patient, think about a doctor needing to get into that spinal space with a needle. Think about if a patient is sitting up straight, all the bones are in the way. So you can see, especially on the bottom one, most doctors have them sit up. And do you see how they're leaning forward? But it's not even just leaning. What I always tell my patients is mad cat. You know how cats arch their back? That's what you want because you're opening up that spinal space to get that needle in. Otherwise, the doctor hits bone with that needle instead of getting through the space between the bones to get to the right place. So you can see how positioning can be so important. And that's what we as nurses help with is that positioning in the room. And lots of times on the bottom one, when they're sitting up, I'll have the FOB or I'll do it because some people don't do well with that. I'll stand in front of them and I will literally push down on their abdomen and show them, okay, right here is where you need to arch your back out. And it just really helps the doctor get that in a lot faster and smoother, okay? So again, this epidural block, anesthetic is injected into the epidural space. Looks like they're getting her ready for a C-section. It's located inside the vertebral column surrounding the dural sac. So see why they need to arch. This patient's up a little straight for me. I think she needs to arch a little bit. The doctor might have a harder time getting it in. But anyways, it's the lumbar region you can see way down on her spine, given in the first or second stage of labor. So first is dilated up till 10. Second stage is pushing and having the baby, right? So yes, they can have it during that if they're able to push and if it works or they can labor down with it. Remember we talked about laboring down? They just don't add the push to the contraction. The body does it for them. So on the right, I found a great picture of this, um, what an epidural looks like once it's been placed and then it gets taped and that tubing is hooked to a pump that does that continuous infusion. Limitations. Personally, yes, patients love them. I don't like the fact that once a patient gets an epidural, they have to have a Foley catheter. It's so many interventions to get an epidural. So they have to have a Foley catheter. They can't eat. And think about this. Your uterus is a muscle. Muscles need to be fed. Labor is exercise. Muscles need to be fed. So I feel like we work against it lots of times with an epidural. That's what I liked about intraspinal narcotics. The patient could still eat. They could pee. They didn't have to have a Foley. There's just, and epidurals are just way more complicated. They can't get in the bathtub. There's just, they can't walk as well. They can't ambulate. They're usually in the bed. And I just, it, you know, people think that epidurals are the do all end all. I completely disagree with that. I think there's a time for them. I honestly do. People that are going to get a C-section because they can't tolerate labor, I'd much rather them get an epidural and be able to um, have a vaginal birth. So there's an, the thing is, there's a time and place for all this. And there's where education comes in. You go in and you tell your patient, here's our options. And again, I try to go over all this early on with my patients when they're not too uncomfortable. Let's talk about what's available for pain when we get to that stage of the game. game. So I talk about the pros and cons of the epidural, pros and cons of the intraspinal narcotic, 
pros and cons of IV pain medicine, things like that. And then they can make an informed decision. Okay. Now, epidural block limitations can't be used if the patient has hypovolemia. Think about that. If they don't have enough volume and their blood pressure drops, there's going to be no oxygenated or minimal oxygenated blood getting to that fetus. So we always want to bolus the mother with one liter of fluid before the epidural. Anticoagulant therapy. If she's on um, Lobinox or anything like that, may lead to formation of a hematoma at the injection site. Blood clotting disorder. If she has a low platelet count, they usually won't do it under 100,000. They usually won't even do it. The doctor won't. What if they have an allergy to bupivacaine? You need to know that for your, very important, um, you know, the numbing agent, lidocaine, bupivacaine, they had numb it before they put it in, and what if they're allergic to that? Or what if they have an infection in their back? Or a systemic infection, if they have choreo, things like that, it's not a good idea to introduce something into their spine. Okay, so when they place an epidural, the anesthesiologist or CRNA, they do a test dose to make sure they're in the right spot because unlike a intraspinal narcotic, okay, intraspinal narcotic, the space they go into is the cerebral spinal fluid. So they get, uh, when they put the needle in, we get cerebral spinal fluid back so we know we're in the right spot, okay? I always watch for that with my patients. With an epidural, they don't go that far in so they don't get that confirmation that they're in the right spot. So that's why they do a test dose. So if they have numbness around the mouth, ringing in the ears, visual disturbances, jitteriness, they could have injected it into a vein instead of into the right spot in the spine. It's kind of a blind thing for the anesthesiologist. So the test dose though is small enough to prevent any long-term adverse effects. So it's really just kind of a, at the time, uncomfortable thing. But they know that they're in the right spot, okay? So if the test dose goes well, then they do, they hook up the main line. So um, again, local anesthetic drugs are usually combined with a small dose of opioid analgesic and it helps it quicker and long lasting pain relief with minimal loss of movement. It depends on how the patient responds. With epidurals, it can be patchy where they have pain relieved, things like that. They're, it's not the do all end all. Sometimes they can ambulate, sometimes they can't. And to maintain pain relief during the labor, again, it's um, hooked up to an infusion pump. The dural puncture that it takes is a relatively large amount of spinal fluid can leak from that hole, which can cause a headache. So the thing about the epidural, that's more for an intraspinal, but the epidural, they can go through the epidural space into that and leak fluid if they go too far. So do you see the anesthesiologist has to be pretty talented to do these. They have to know what they're doing. And they, most of them have done it enough that they're pretty darn good at it. But adverse effects, maternal hypotension. So again, when mom gets hypotensive, baby, you can see a response in baby. And um, sometimes we have to give them ephedrine, mom, to bring their blood pressure back up. Think about that tremendous just initial relaxation of the mom and their vessels relax, everything relaxes, and all of a sudden the pressure just drops. Urinary retention due to reduced sensation. So that's why you have to have a catheter in. Otherwise, if there's a hospital that doesn't require a Foley catheter, the bladder should be assessed for distension every two hours after a block and watch for level of sensation. Some blocks can go too high and cause respiratory issues. Postspinal headache can occur, and um, a blood patch would be the fix for it if it's bad enough. 
and a patient may not be able to feel the urge to push with these epidural blocks. You have to do a lot, a lot of vital signs and assessments after an epidural or intraspinal is placed. Every five minute vital signs and then every 15 and then every 30 and then every hour. And um, we usually continue a IV fluids going so that they get enough volume. So subarachnoid block, a spinal block. This is my favorite. I like it because the anesthesiologist comes does a shot and lasts for a few hours and usually that can get a woman through to pushing or a couple of them. So the subarachnoid block used for vaginal and cesarean bursts, similar to epidural but enters into the subarachnoid space. It's a one shot block like we said. Again, positioning is very important while getting this injection okay we need to do curl her back like the mad cat like i said they in your book it says a c shape we're on page 175 right now the dura is punctured with a small needle and we get the spinal fluid back and then we put the anesthetic drug or the usually it's the opioid the fentanyl in there anesthesia we always tell our patients that it takes a few contractions because think about it, it's bathing those nerves. So it takes a little bit for those nerves to get completely bathed. So it takes a few contractions for them to get the full effect of the um, shot. Okay, so informed consent is required. The doctor has to come in and tell them all the side effects and pros and cons of it. We always um, empty the woman's bladder before the doctor inserts it assist again for positioning the woman they we bolus these patients also and monitor for hypotension always 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 monitor a fetal heart rate and assist woman afterwards with position changes side effects from the spinal blocks here's where you get the spinal headaches so years and years and years ago you heard a lot more about spinal headaches because they used a bigger needle. So think about this. If you use a bigger needle and your platelets don't come and fix it very well, that spot where the hole is, like we talked about before, then the cerebral spinal fluid can keep dripping out. And that's where you lose your cushion around your brain. That's why when they lay down and get it even, your cerebral spinal fluid even in the body, the headache goes away. You sit up. Now you don't have that cushion around your brain. Your brain's basically just kind of bouncing around in your skull and it causes a headache. So that's when we do a blood patch and um, what it is. In fact, I'll just tell you a story. We had this, if you don't know what a locums doctor is, an anesthesiologist, um, what they are is like um, registries. For doctors so this time we had them because one of our regular anesthesiologists went on vacation so they called this registry basically and had a fill-in anesthesiologist come to help with our patients this was years and years ago at our old birth center and it was a woman so she comes in and I this is where I like live classroom so I can show you exactly what she did but I got the patient all positioned. She was my labor patient. I'd been with her for hours and hours. Got the patient all positioned. And um, the, the and this was my first experience with this anesthesiologist, although I'd heard from a few other people she was a little crazy. She was probably in her 40s. And she starts, so she numbs up the patient, but then she starts putting the intraspinal needle in. And all of a sudden she starts going, oh, baby, baby, I'm hitting bone. I'm hitting bone. And I'm like looking at the patient. The patient's looking at me. And I thought, for one thing, you don't want the patient to know they're hitting bone. That's not good. 
And so I'm like, okay, let's get you better in a mad cat position. Let's arch her back out better so she's not hitting the bone. And she'd go, oh, baby, baby, oh, baby, baby. And then I'm hitting bone, I'm hitting bone. Well, then all of a sudden I realized she has gotten the introducer huge needle into the cerebral spinal space instead of the tiny little needle that you put through the introducer. And I'm watching, the patient's looking at me, I'm watching, and all of a sudden I look at the patient's back and cerebral spinal fluid is just dripping out of her. And the doctor leaves the room. And I'm standing there, and I was a fairly new OB nurse there then, just a few years experience. And I didn't know what to do. I knew enough that it was like I wanted to, like a you see like on dams that are leaking that you want to put a finger there and hold the water back, right? That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to put a finger, but think about this. If I didn't have a sterile glove on, which I didn't, and I pressed on that and bacteria got into her spine, it could kill her. So I was standing there going, okay, I don't know what to do right now. And then while I was trying to decide what to do, the doctor comes running back in with another syringe. And finally, we get the spinal taken care of. Well, what do you think happened? Yes. So she got pain relief, had the baby. Next day, horrific spinal headache. I knew it. I knew she was going to have a spinal headache. So guess who it is again? That doctor. So she comes to do a blood patch and she does the same thing, standing behind her going, oh, baby, baby, I'm hitting bone. When she's putting the needle in and I'm drawing the blood from the front. So what you do is you draw blood up into a syringe, you hand it to the doctor and they put it in the spine so the theory is that the platelets and everything will go directly to that hole and patch it. Well, finally, I she was poking her so much that I thought, I've got to put a stop to this. And the nursing supervisor came by and I ran out and said, I don't know what to do. She goes, tell her to stop. So I was just going back in to tell her to stop when she finally got it in and did the patch. So in the meantime, after that happened, other nurses had bad experiences with this doctor. We call everybody who would listen and tell them that we do not want her back. So we got the president of the hospital management, everybody who would listen to us, head of anesthesia and everybody saying we don't want her back ever. So I said, she's dangerous. Our manager said to the president of the hospital, she goes, I wouldn't let her touch my dog. She goes, if she, if I see her at the door, I'm going to lay in front of that door so she can't come into our birth center. So they promised us they wouldn't send her again. And the head of anesthesia said, we'll just keep her in the main OR because she seemed to do fine there. It was with these intraspinal narcotics that she didn't do well with. So I get a call one day from one of our anesthesiologists who is no longer there and who was, I'm sorry, what most of us and, and a doctor started this. He was a little pissant. He was just such a jerk. And he calls me one day and I was in charge and he says, Stacy, now, you know, doctors need to go on vacations too. So I got this doctor so-and-so to fill in for me. You girls just need to learn how to get along. Okay, well, you guys don't know me very well now, but say something like that to me. Oh, my goodness. So I just said back to him, doctor, it is not a matter of girls getting along. It is a matter of her brutalizing our patients and causing harm. So. Talk to the president of the hospital because we were assured that we would no longer have her at our birth center. Well, he didn't like that, of course. Called the president of the hospital and guess what? President told him the same thing. And then 
a few weeks later, I get a call from that patient and the patient said, I'm thinking of suing that doctor. Would you back me up? Well, think about the position that put me in. So here's what I said to her. I said, I can't tell you that. What I can say to you is I will tell the truth in a court of law about what I observed. Well, nothing more came of it, but I did hear another patient sued her and um, it was ugly. And everyone, it was kind of funny because the anesthesiologist kind of stuck up for her because in the main OR she was good. Well, then guess what? In the middle of the night, our head anesthesiologist who had said, come on, Stacy, she's okay. Who's my friend and who I really like? And who I said, no, she's not okay. Something's wrong. He got a drunken call from her in the middle of the night and she never came back again. So, hmm. The other point to that is be strong, be an advocate to your, for your patients. And our unit stood together. Our nurses stood together. We unified to make our units safe for our patients. And sometimes that's just what you have to do. It's hard, but you got to do it. It's part of your oath as a nurse. Okay. So blood patch usually is awesome. The thing is, anesthesiologists don't always come immediately to do those because using caffeine, fluids, um, laying flat for a couple of days usually does it. If you don't need to put another needle into someone's spine, we'd rather not. But if they really need it, of course we do. It's just if other things will work, believe it or not, they say give them a lot of caffeine. They're not real positive, the mechanism of why that works, but it does. It really helps. Just load them up with caffeine. And then, of course, you if they get the blood patch, avoid coughing or straining because you don't want to break loose that clot, right? But this picture shows where they put the um, blood in for the patch. So safety alert, I put this here on the right so you could see the different things and the different levels of a spinal. When spinal anesthesia is used, assess for numbness of fingers. Drug may have reached the L6, L8 level, could affect the diaphragm and could lead to respiratory problems. That's called a high spinal and that can cause major issues. Super rare. I think I've seen it once or twice ever but um, it can happen and we have to give them support when that happens. Okay, local infiltration is just, you know, numbing up the area. And this is what we used to do all the time for episiotomies when those were the thing. So they just, it's exactly what the picture shows. The doctor puts his fingers behind, of course, so you don't inject into the fetal head or anything like that, right? And they numb that area if they think they need to do an episiotomy. Can also be used for laceration repair. Virtually no risks, but it just numbs the area. Just remember, some people have toxicity to local anesthetics. So it's rare, but if they become disoriented, tinnitus, twitching, seizures, you may want to think about that um, toxicity. Here's the pudendal, okay? Used for vaginal births and provides adequate anesthesia for an episiotomy, not for the contractions, for the episiotomy. Does not block pain from contractions injected by provider into the pudendal nerves through the vagina. So on the left, you can see that's the trumpet that I was telling you about that the needle goes through so that they have control. Okay, and to you don't want to put a needle all the way through someone's vagina, you're going to cause damage. So this goes through, then you put the needle through and just inject it. On the left hand picture, you can see the trumpet and then the needle through. And on the right, you can see the pudendal nerve that they're trying to get to to cause the 
do the block. Again, you hardly ever see these anymore. Okay, let's see if we've missed anything. Um, okay, I think we got that. On to general anesthesia. So we try super hard not to use general anesthesia unless it's an emergency because you have to get the baby out so fast before it's affected. Um, a few of the times that I've had to do CPR on a baby, it's because they got too much general anesthesia. Thank goodness they come around and usually they do fine, but it's very scary when you're in the middle of it. So general anesthesia may be used in the following circumstances. Emergency C-section. If your baby's heart rate is down in the 50s, you don't want to take the time to do a block. You've got to get that baby out as fast as possible. Or in a cesarean birth in a woman who refuses or has a contraindication to having a block. Or if they have an allergy to lidocaine, they can't do the block. A patient who's had multiple back surgeries, they're not good candidates for regional blocks trying to get into the right space, right? So I just wanted to show on the right, that's how we do the C-sections. After the baby's born and assessed and everything, we bring the baby over to mama. You can see the drape on the top and um, that's exactly what we do. We try to put the baby to breast, but C-section babies don't get that squeeze, so they're not always vigorous for breastfeeding at that time, but we try. And then the lower picture is just showing the whole field, the surgeons and the scrub tech and circulator. And at the head is the patient, usually the FOB or significant other sitting there on a stool next to her, unless it's general anesthesia. And, but this looks like general anesthesia and the doctor is getting ready to put the mask on to put her out and they will intubate, right? Okay. Again, general anesthesia, adverse effects, regurg of aspiration of gastric contents, that can be horrible, can result in chemical injury to the lungs. It can cause death. So it's nothing to take lightly. That's why if you ever think C-section, don't let them eat. Adverse effects in the neonate, respiratory depression, because that drug crosses the placenta and that's why the baby is so harshly affected. Aggressive resuscitation may be necessary, just like I said, we had to do that a few times. And then the recovery for the mom is terrible. With a intraspinal narcotic, they get um, up to 24 hours of pain relief from it. They don't have to take any pain medicine. General anesthesia, when they wake up, they're in pain. They usually have to have PCAs and narcotics, and it's just a whole different recovery. So general anesthesia, I've never seen it given for a vaginal birth, but I guess there's a time and a place for it. Or if you already had her under anesthesia and all of a sudden the baby popped out, right? Sometimes used in emergency C-sections, relieves pain through loss of consciousness. And again, our risks are aspiration and regurgitation. Crosses the barrier to the fetus and fetus will be under its effects at birth in the postpartum period causes uterus to relax and not contract. So these are all reasons why we would rather not do a general unless it's emergent or we don't have an option. What are our responsibilities during general anesthesia? Assessment and documentation of oral intake, administration of medications, providing key information to the woman. They're scared when they're told they're going to have a C-section. So I try so hard to give them as much information as I can before they go back to the OR. And um, we usually are the same one that goes back and takes care of the babies. So we're back there. We're not the nurse for the patient. We're now nurse for the doctor, but we can give them support and information while we're back in the OR. They want to know how long till the baby's out and um, how will the baby do? When will I get to hold my baby? Things like that. And um, 
the woman should be questioned closely about what allergies to, she has to foods, to drugs, to um, has she had any reactions to dental anesthetics? Is she allergic to latex? Preferences for pain relief? Sometimes, again, people insist on general and some people absolutely are like, do not do general on me. So women often receive these explanations of what's going to happen when they're uncomfortable and they don't remember any everything. So we help afterwards, to, we help during getting the, end, the spinal, if they're getting a spinal back in the operating room. Usually for just a C-section, they don't get an epidural, they get an intraspinal, the one-shot thing with the anesthetic and the opioid, okay? And we help position them back in the OR to get that. We help, usually they get the Foley catheter after anesthesia. So we help hold their legs and help the circulating nurse to put the catheter in. And then we get the baby. And we try to explain things to the mom if we can. Bring the dad in after the mom is draped. When the drape is up, the dad comes in, sits at the head of the bed on a stool, and is there for support of the mom. Okay. Okay, so we want to, after um, getting a general anesthetic, we want to um, postoperatively check vital signs. Of course, we do that for any surgery. Bundle massage, assess for signs of hemorrhage and urinary output. They don't usually hemorrhage after a C-section, but sometimes they do. So you've got to be just as ready. So post-operative assessment. What we want to do is respiratory rate, usually hourly for 24 hours and includes assessing mother and newborn for late appearing respiratory depression, which can happen and excessive sedation. If epidural narcotics given after a cesarean birth could last up to 24 hours. That's why doctors won't let a patient go home before 24 hours after receiving an intraspinal or epidural because of this late respiratory depression that can happen. And they have to keep an IV or a saline lock in for 24 hours after. We always assess level of cessation when they get their feeling back in their toes, wiggle their toes, move their legs. If a woman complains of numbness in the chest or higher, this is an emergency. This is a high spinal and should be reported immediately. We also want to watch her urinary output from the catheter. It should be observed for color and quantity. Think about this. If you go into your patient's room two hours after cesarean and the um, Foley looks pinkish or reddish, the surgeon may have nicked the bladder and we need to let them know as soon as possible. It should not be bloody. It should be yellow. Now it can be amber because the patient's not well hydrated because of labor, things like that, but it should not be bloody or pink. That is something we need to notify the surgeon immediately, okay? So, moving on to page 178 or 79, I should say. And this nursing care plan is something good to look at. Oh, pharmacological techniques, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, it's still page 177, sorry about that. So the nurse's role always, always, always begins at admission. The minute they walk through the door, remember, you start your evaluation of your patient, your assessment. How are they walking? Are they grimacing in pain? Do they have support? Things like that. Question them again about allergies to food, drugs, latex. Remember, if they're allergic to bananas, they could be allergic to latex. So we've got to be careful about that. Talking about Pain relief, keep the side rails up on the bed, provide education regarding the procedures and expected effects, and um, observe for hypotension and respiratory depression. Some of this is, you guys, um, double doing, but I just, I want it to be solidified in your brains. Assessment of oral intake and administration of medications to reduce gastric acidity. Some doctors order like Reglan or Bicitra, things like that before the surgery so that they don't have as much reflux. 
you always document interventions and assessments. And I think that's the last page. I'll see in a minute. It seems like it locks me out as soon as I click the arrow. But anyway, so listen to those videos. They're required um, part of today because this is only, you know, an hour and 40 minute long lecture, which is why we didn't do it live today. But that's why you need to watch the videos and do your case study. And of course, you'll have your quiz at the, before you do this. So have a good day. Oh, question for review. Forgot this one. What are two priority assessments for a woman who has received epidural analgesia during labor? Okay. We're going to assess her respiratory rate, assess for hypotension, and we're going to assess for urinary retention. Okay? Okay. Have a good day.